Okay, our next speaker is uh, Karen Lam uh, Panka. She's going to talk about population spike tuning, dependent plasticity, and synaptic tagging and capture in hippocampal area CA1. Oh, wow. Hi. Uh, so I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share my work. Uh, it really just started out as an FYP project, but then I published it earlier this year. So I think I see quite a young crowd here with us today. I wonder how many of you are gamers. But if you do play video games, you realize that um, if your monitor has a lack of more than 60 milliseconds, then it's really annoying, it's really bad. But then if your lag is less than 20 milliseconds, you can't really tell the difference. But then to neurons, or neurons in the hippocampus at least, uh, a 10 to 20 milliseconds difference in two events could really make all the difference in the world in terms of synaptic plasticity. So in a process called spike timing dependent plasticity, the magnitude and the direction of synaptic modification is determined by the order and the timings between pre- and post-synaptic action potentials. So for example, in this classical SDDP curve, when the pre-synaptic spike comes before the post-synaptic spike, within 40 milliseconds, you see a potentiation. So a lot of these SDDP experiments were done in single cells, uh, cultured neurons using patch clamp. And then we, but then we wanted to see if we could see similar phenomena with the tools we have in the lab. So if we could see similar phenomena with um, field electrophysiology and slice preparations, we could use it to address a lot of questions. One particular advantage is that because with our field uh, recordings, we could record for a much longer duration than with patch clamp, then we can ask the question of whether the persistence or long-term endurance of the synaptic modifications could also be a function of the order and timings between pre- and post-synaptic activities. So in order to do so, I took uh, slices from the rat hippocampus and I recorded from the synapses between the CA3 and the CA1 neurons. And in, on each slice, I had three stimulating electrodes. So the first one, the purple one there, uh, I put it on the alveus layer, which really contains a bundle of axons from the CA1 pyramidal neurons. So this, stimu uh, this stimulates mainly postsynaptic uh, activity. And I also have two other electrodes, um, the red and the blue one, stimulating the Schaffer collaterals. So these would be the presynaptic input onto the CA1 neurons. So I induce plasticity with a pairing, what I call a pairing protocol. So what I do is I give a stimulus to the purple electrode and a stimulus to the red electrode. So I call this a pair. So I repeat these pre and post stimulations for 20 times at one hertz. And what I see is a very persistent um, potentiation that lasts more than four hours. So when I first started out, it was really striking to me that such a low frequency and almost minimal stimulation could lead to such long-term um, strengthening of the synapses. Because just for comparison, we typically induce LTP with what we call a high-frequency stimulation protocol of 100 hertz and 100 pulses. So 20 pairs and a, at 1 hertz, it's really nothing. Uh, but then, of course, with our extracellular stimulation, we can't really precisely control the timings of uh, neuronal spikes. So we also validated our results with a uh, whole cell patch clamp. So even at the single cell level, when we give our pairing stimulation, we see a very instantaneous increase in synaptic responses. And when we just stimulate the Schaeffer collaterals alone or the LVS layer alone, we don't see re uh, changes in synaptic responses. So to address our initial question, we played around with the timings a little. We stimulated the presynaptic part before the postsynaptic part with delays from 10 to 40 milliseconds and we swapped the order and we gave postsynaptic stimulations before the presynaptic one with delays from 10 to 30 milliseconds. So to cut a long story short, my results are summarized in this graph. Uh, so 
what we see essentially is an SDDP-like phenomenon with um, asymmetric plasticity window of around 30 milliseconds. And the main takeaway point is that the long-term endurance, as we can see from our four-hour recordings, is also a function of the order and timings between um, the pre- and postsynaptic activities. So SDDP in itself, it's a form of associative plasticity. And our lab also looks at another form of long-term associative plasticity called spike, uh, synaptic tagging and capture. So it's a framework first proposed by Frey and Morris to explain a set of experimental results in which a short-lasting LTP, uh, we call it early LTP, that typically wanes over two hours, could be transformed into a longer-lasting one when this early LTP is preceded by a longer-lasting LTP. So if you could just imagine that ugly cartoon to be a dendrite with two independent synaptic inputs, when the first synaptic input re receives a very strong uh, stimulation, this activity would lead to local changes in the spines in the activated synapses. This activity also leads to trigger the translation of plasticity-related products. And these tags could capture these products and use them to stabilize local synaptic changes. And with that comes a very persistent um, LTP. And when the second synaptic input receives a weaker form of stimulation that typically just leads to a, a short-term potentiation and local uh, changes in the synapses, the setting of the tag, uh, because there are now plasticity-related products floating around, these tags could also capture these products and use them to stabilize the local changes. And now the short-term uh, short LTP could be transformed into a longer lasting one. Right, so with that in mind, we tried out um, similar synaptic tagging and capture experiments uh, with our pairing protocol. So we first induced a persistent potentiation with a pairing protocol. And after, two, uh, after an hour, in an independent synaptic input, we gave it a weak tetanization that typically leads to um, early LTP. But then in A, you can see that um, in both synaptic inputs, the, the LTPs stayed on for more than three hours. So what this experiment really tells us that even with our pairing protocol, we could already trigger the synthesis of plasticity-related products. And our pairing protocol, the potentiation induced by our pairing protocol probably also um, make use of certain mechanistic components that's similar to uh, conventional high-frequency induced LTP. Well, then there's another process called um, cross-tagging in which uh, LTP could strengthen um, LTD in another uh, independent synaptic input. But then with our pairing protocol, we don't see a similar cross-tagging phenomenon. And what it implies is that probably with our pairing protocol, the potentiation uh, leads to certain mechanistic changes in the, in the neuron that's not common with um, LTD. So just to summarize, the main Takeaway point is really that if you can force two groups of neurons to function or be active at the same time, such uh, even such a very low number of such synchronous activities could lead to a very long-term strengthening of their connections. And with that, I thank my boss and the team at the lab, as well as our funding agencies. Thank you. Let's take questions. Hi, uh, that was amazing data. That is very interesting. Uh, 
Uh, thank you for the talk. So uh, one clarification I have is, so the last slide you're showing that when you have a PT, uh, P, sorry, a paired pulse based um, STDP, and then you induce uh, LTD, that also is strengthened? Is that what you're saying in the A portion? Oh, but um, the cross tagging is happening also for LTD and? Uh, so, so in A, it's um, the conventional high frequency stimulation induced oh, LTP. I see. I see. So it, what we're trying is in B, so with our pairing protocol, we don't see the strengthening of LTD into a more longer lasting one. So. Right, so would that suggest that there are different mechanisms which are being uh, triggered through um, these two, because these two protocols? In yes, the yes, yes, um, that's um, what it tells us. And just to give you an example, we, we tried whether uh, our pairing induced potentiation would make use of BDNF but then, and BDNF has been shown to be important for early LTD to be transformed into late LTD. But then with our pairing protocol, this potentiation doesn't really need BDNF and doesn't really re lead to the release of BDNF. And it could probably be why um, our LTD could not be transformed into a longer lasting one. Okay, Karen, thanks so much for that fascinating talk. I think that's maybe, for some reason, STDP is not so much studied in the hippocampus. Um, so that was really wonderful to see.